Okay. Well, welcome to uh, Normandale's paper <laughs> land, Karen, um, release party. Okay. And uh, I'm just trying to figure out if I can, um, if I can, can uh, sp uh, spotlight myself. I don't think I can. So uh, <laughs> I'm just moving around here. So um, this is the Paper Lantern, Normandale Student Literary Magazine. We're celebrating its um, issue and um, spring issue today. This is volume 16, issue number two. So we've been doing this um, under the Paper Lantern name for 16 years. I'm going to share my screen. Um, and so you can see we have also published this. This is handy for um, COVID times. This is on the Paper Lantern website, thepaperlantern.org. Do not um, Google Paper Lantern because then you will find lots of um, paper lanterns to purchase. <laughs> so, um, uh, so here it is, thepaperlantern.org. And this is our front cover um, by Emma Hinson, who's actually here with us, who's going to be speaking about it in a few minutes. You can download the PDF. By the way, there's our beautiful back cover. And that artist could not join us. She's um, with her family um, heading to a camping trip in some state park in Colorado. So. Um, beautiful artwork there. I'm going to stop sharing here and I'm going to invite Emma Hinson to talk a little bit about her artwork. Um, so this is a, a piece I named A Woman's Beautiful Power. Um, I really enjoy painting and creating stills of moments that I see in the world. Um, and this one was inspired from a moment I was driving through Minneapolis and I saw a woman on the side of the road advocating for herself and her beliefs. Um, it was really beautiful to see and she used the power of her voice to stand up for what was right. Um, and I could see that she had no fear and she would not back down from anything. Um, so I decided to create that and the rose, um, I wanted to see that like, she was as, as delicate as the rose petals um but she also had the strength and the power as like a rose has thorns thank you for that emma um let's see i'm going to unspotlight you this is so hard for me to do <laughs> thank you thank you very much emma um and so uh, I think that I, I also need to say that this year, um, the, the students in Normandale's Creative Writing AFA two-year degree program, the Capstone program, put together this magazine. Um, it was part of their class project, uh, and they all did a great job. And I just want to thank Cody Olson for doing the... Um, uh, um, the photoshopping. So Cody, if you want to just say, I, I didn't tell you I would call on you, but um, do you want to talk about what it was like to work with the art and put it together so it was ready for printing? Yeah, um, firstly, I'd just like to thank the artists. Um, everyone who submitted, they really did a great job and I can appreciate the effort that Normandale puts into you know, our creative department. So um, I wanna congratulate everyone that was published within the uh, Paper Lantern. And um, it was an honor to uh, put you guys on the front and back cover and everyone else who's uh, throughout the book, congratulations. Great. Thanks, Cody. Okay. Um, next, we're going to have a poet um, who has a piece in the magazine. So that would be Shelby Lango. Um, and I'm going to spotlight you and Shelby, go ahead. Okay. So my poem, um, that I submitted, it's called the time it takes to love. And there is another version of this poem that lives out in the world, um, since submitting this one. Um, but I will just read you mine. The time it takes to love. There's something about that dead weight, about holding someone somewhere between asleep and not there yet. They're two feet dangling while you find that balance, make your way, 
and you know you couldn't, but you would. You'd hardly make it through the door, but you'd carry that weight, all of it, all of them forever, or at the very least, the rest of the way, regardless of how your arms felt, like they'd been above your head for days, that numbness. That blood going down feels better than the moment of regain. When the odd life beneath your skin prickles like a pin art board asking around, unable to translate the sudden absence. And though I lay beside you now and share stories into your sleeping palm, admire the way it folds in on itself, there could never be enough time. There could never be enough time between you and me, between those walls of your palm. And I know this when I hold you, I'm most certain when I set you down. As I count your breaths that reach me, I wonder how your face will change because right now it looks just like your father's and I want so badly to keep you this way. Unknowing, my dead weight next to yours, unknowing, having just carried you in from the car. Thank you so much, Shelby, that was beautiful. Um, and I'm just going to unspotlight you um thank you that was gorgeous um i um as you started reading i realized that i had meant to um show everybody what the inside of the paper lantern looks like um and so here it is um this is on the web page as well obviously um and shelby's poem is the first one there so there it is for those of you who like to see how poems are lined. There it is. So thank you so much, Shelby. Now, the next author um, we have in the book is Alyssa Ulip. Alyssa, is Alyssa here? I didn't see her a minute ago when I was looking. I know that she had some issues with not being sure if she was going to be um, traveling with her family. So maybe maybe that's what's going on but Alyssa if you're here um, uh, speak up or write me in the chat <laughs> so I'll know um, so I think we're going to move on to Terry Joyce um, Terry Joyce mostly has poetry um, in the issue but she also has some artwork um, so there's some artwork and if you want to talk about your artwork too uh, Terry you can but here is the beginning of one of her poems and she has several poems in the magazine. So um, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, Terry, I'll spotlight you and you can start reading. Well, I will first mention it's so fortuitous that that picture is right before my poem because the poem I'm going to read is about a person behind the camera taking a shot. And the fact that it's an animal that has no say just really hits me between the eyes. So <laughs> well, I'll go on to read my, my poem. Taken. I don't see the white male, fully clothed, anonymous behind a camera, but he is there. I see a photographic subject, clothes taken, stripped even of her pronoun, akin to a free couch out on the curb, an object, no introduction needed. Placed in the desired light, positioned, turned, arranged. Did he touch it? No permission asked. Adjust the neck or shoulder. He made a scientific profile of this living soul, captured the slope of forehead to chin, the length of ear to jaw, the fullness of the lips, the roundness of the skull beneath short woolly hair, hooded eye looking downward and straight right. Did he even notice the sadness of her face? Expression dead as a taxidermic specimen. Young enough, bare breasts would flush her face, thin enough to show an edge of rib cage a hint of definition at the shoulder. He took her picture, her image, her choice. He took the right to say who looks. He took an inventory, measurements, evidence to support a racist theory. He took away her story. 
to talk and talk and talk. 135 years later, an artist found her nameless in a museum archive, saw the woman's story taken from home and family, used, enslaved. The artist blew up the image, wrenched it red in blood, in rage, hung it in a gallery with 33 others for everyone to see, to grasp what had been taken. I looked and saw what happened behind that camera lens. The white man, invisible, but there. And this piece was inspired by um, a piece done by Carrie, Carrie Mae Weems. Uh, the show was, from here I saw what happened and I cried. And the individual piece that this is about was called you became a scientific profile. And then can I read my second one? Yes, you have time. Go ahead. OK. Um, sometimes the world rips me up, knowing of the hate and torture, the nightly news, a crown of thorns piercing my mind with horror. Sometimes the world tears me open, like when I ran to see the bumpy red fish with bulging eyes and gaping mouth, yanked out of the ocean, then watched it writhe and thrash, dying for no reason. Sometimes the world strips me bare, unadorned, like Eve after the apple, scrambling for cover. Sometimes the pain of this terrible communion of mingling with the broken leaves my soul in tatters, sometimes. Oh, that was beautiful. Thank you. That was Terry Joyce reading some of her poems. Thank you so much. Um, Terry, your, your work has really, really um, raised the level of the magazine. All of your work has raised the level of the magazine. Um, and Chris, I don't, I don't, um, uh, I hope I'm, you don't mind me quoting you. Um, you were looking at the pieces or no, actually it was, it was for a, um, a contest we had, but I think it's also true of the paper lantern pieces. We have some of the best, um, writers, um, this semester and it's, it's, it's just really cool. So thank you for that. Okay, um, so Terry, while you're reading, um, Alyssa Ulip did make it in here. Let's see, Alyssa, there you are. Uh, Hi. <laughs> um, the AFA, I mean, not the AFA, um, the Creative Writing Club is here, or some of us are here. Oh, you're outside. That's right. It's working. We're at school. <laughs> Tom is here. Christine and Amanda. Oh. Great. Um, we um we were having te technical difficulties. So whoever's running Facebook needs to move away from you guys because we're getting we're hearing the um. <laughs> He ran away. <laughs> it's okay, Tom. All right. I all yelled right. at him. I'm sorry. <laughs> Are you? No. So, so Alyssa did. Did you did you want to read um, some of your poems that are in the paper lantern? Um, we don't have copies yet. Would it be all right if someone shares their screen so Alyssa can like read hers from that? I'll do that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry. I and if, if you if you actually okay. if you go to the you paper making lantern, my mind. <laughs> if you go to the paper lantern webpage, the paperlantern.org, the PDF is there, so you can download it there. But here, if you can see this. There's there's one poem, and I think you have a couple, right? Yeah, I have, I think, two or three more. OK. Um, so this was actually inspired by my grandparents um, in some ways. So this is Till We Meet Again. Um, photo booth from the carnival, summer in front of the Eiffel Tower. Trips to New York, no longer will Blue be your companion. I will always be there. Pink peonies sprout on our first date. Sunflowers <clears throat> roots that make our love eternal. 
red carnations displayed my deep love. No longer will sadness fill the lungs. I will breathe comforting words. The white itchy fabric you wore the day of our vows. The gray shirt with uh, the big orange cat that our grandchildren gave. The jacket I lent to you the day we met. No longer will you wear a heavy heart. I will use my strength to lift you. The popcorn we strung on and ate during Christmas, the countless amounts of ice cream eaten for nine months, <clears throat> late night orders of Chinese food weigh on our drives to no nowhere. No longer will you taste the salty tears on your tongue. My fingers will wipe them away. Sounds coming from outside your window, loud claps of thunder, at, as everything came down, the peace and melody of our first date till forever. No longer will you tune out the sound of our love. I will make it heard throughout the rest of time. Thank you. And I think, yeah, let me just scroll through here. Uh, I don't know if I can spotlight you and share my screen at the same time. Um, I don't know, will the internet explode if I try to do that? Uh, <laughs> Christine says yes. <laughs> it's it's working so far. Okay, good. You can read this one too. Then. Okay. You look at a brown pigmented almond eyed person, uneducated, lazy, alcoholic, or a gang member. People I know love drinking Captain Morgan, Heineken, and Grey Goose every day of the week. And have no need for an AA meeting. PhD Pacific Islanders are changing the game of history more than the phone you text on day to day. People are afraid of my resting bitch face more than the association of my last name. Lazy, I can agree with that. I mean, sure, I'd rather lay in bed 24 hours a day than plan on passing my finals, but this should apply to, to your race as well. Dropping out of college for being too hard, <coughs> quitting um, day jobs to lose Netflix subscriptions the next week. Do not confine me in your boxes. Do not associate my race and color of my skin to my past and future. Thank you, Alyssa. You look, and we've got one more from you. <laughs> Do you want to read it? Um, she moves throughout the shadows, making sure her human does not see her. Leaping from one end to another, <clears throat> grandmother's precious mirror from 1845 all across the floor. She remarks on their torture as ominous shatters are assembled in this looking glass. Hung over the, the counter of strange shapes, and this oh, translucent bottle with grains inside. It should not be here. I want to taste it. All over the floor, next to the reflections of myself, the taste too unpleasant now as the garbage. Stretch um, to the tall structure against the wall from the opening to another top, slinking up this arrangement at the sound of stomps to go back into the shadows Yet at the bang of the 13th hour, all came undone. Thank you for that, Alyssa. That was great. Um, I should mention that Alyssa was all, also the person who was um, handling club <laughs> submissions, or sorry, not that uh, was handling paper lantern submissions and getting them um, <laughs> anonymously evaluated um by by the capstone class uh and that's a role she also does with the creative writing club and members of the creative writing club are there and um meeting outside in normandale's japanese garden with her so um you'll be seeing some of that some some of them reading um as well later on okay um the next person on the list i believe is ashley maleka um, Ashley, I'm going to spotlight you, um, and let's see, 
Oh, I need to, let's see, hang on a second. I need to unspotlight. There we go. Okay. So now it's Ashley is spotlighted. And um, before you start reading, I'll just show maybe where one of your poems is. I don't know if this is the order you were planning on reading in, in the magazine, but uh, let's see, where are we? I'm sort of trying to do this in order. This, there we go. So there's one of your poems there. So um, just for our viewers, um, they can see one of them. I'll stop sharing my screen so you can go ahead and read. Um, Nypathy was um, inspired by Greek mythology, a river in the underworld that essentially makes you um, forget bad memories. So, um, Nypathy. Asleep in a field of poppies, drunk from a drop of potion, and dead, always drifting between one state of consciousness and the next, lost and forgotten in the unknown, sunken faces cloaked in darkness as secret sea, sent chills down the backs and across arms of those who pass by. She is suffering. One sniff, spritz, sip all it takes to forget your pain and sorrow, they say. Lethe drowned herself in a river of her tears. She gazes at the ancient. The darkness in her eyes is like violet flowers. Please, she begs, taking a small, fragile falcon, tipping her head back, and swallows a single drop of strong, sweet, and yet potent potion. Um, the next poem is an ode to the house I used to live on. It is called O2 County Road 47. After your rambler got piled down, I drove by the land. I saw the changes. There used to be just a house with a will tree and horse barn. Back into the 2000s when I dwelled on your land, land I went sudding down the two hills and into little pasture. My mother taught my sister and I how to ride three horses. Goldie the stubborn pody, pony, Dazzle the one-eyed horse, and Elaine my grand aunt's show horse. In the hand-me-down western saddles bareback, just as she had grown up in a little farm town at horse shows and county fairs. A few times from the fence, I watched Titan, wanted to imagine him racing around the trucks, galloping ahead of other horses. Too bad I didn't, but in the long run, what did it matter? My family was lucky to board him, the huge muscular thoroughbred, one of Secretariat's descendants. Oh, how I miss your hills. Each time I go by, I look for the trail that may be hidden on new paths, rows of homes, form a new a neighborhood. I squint and see the road once more. A car that arrived with two dogs, a family of three and another on the way. A trailer of two horses and enough to raise a family, settling into a place of new beginnings. Most continued, some ended. That was beautiful. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you. Okay. Um, and our next reader um, would be Ala Bulos. Um, and Ala, I will just um, show your one of your pieces, um, prose pieces um, uh, that you contributed to the magazine. So um, you won't be able to read the whole thing, um, but hopefully you can give us a flavor of where it goes so we don't feel like we're missing out completely so i'm going to spotlight you there you go you're on hi friends i'm ala bulos i'll be reading from the immigrant blues which appears first in the magazine they're both lengthy pieces so i'm going to read a page or two depending on where it ends um so immigrant blues Every year, the United States naturalizes between 620 to 780,000 people. Naturalizing is a process of transformation from a resident of a country into its citizen. This process, which requires the applicant to be a lawful permanent resident of good moral character with the knowledge of English language and an attachment to the principles of the US Constitution, is completed at a naturalization ceremony. The, um, there are roughly 160 naturalization ceremonies performed each year. The key component of this ceremony is the oath of allegiance. 
I hereby declare on oath that I absolutely and entirely renounce and abjure all allegiance and fidelity to any foreign prince, potentate, state, or sovereignty of whom or we or which I have therefore been a subject or a citizen. I took this oath on March 25th, 2012. In the eight years that have elapsed since then, I have not thought about it in depth. I just remember the overwhelming melancholy that flooded my chest before and during the ceremony. Most people rightfully consider American citizenship a privilege and an honor, and so do I. However, I am concurrently also a citizen of Russia, the country I grew up in. I'm a dual citizen. So how do I reconcile this oath for myself? Renounce any foreign state? How can I renounce my motherland? How can anyone? I should, however, count my blessings, as some countries don't even allow dual citizenships. Notably, India and China can make you renounce their citizenship if accepting another, but not Russia or Greece or Egypt. My father-in-law was a dual citizen of Egypt and the US. My mother-in-law, on the other hand, was a Palestinian refugee whose country's name and citizenship were eradicated from the records altogether. My brother lives in Switzerland and dreams of becoming a dual citizen, so he can get the benefit of not worrying about being deported if he loses his job. And what of all the undocumented immigrants who are being hunted down, deported, and separated from their children? They surely wouldn't give this blessing a second thought. The United States allows dual citizenship only by virtue of ignoring its existence. Dual citizenship is not mentioned in the Constitution or addressed in the Immigration and Nationality Act. The US does not care what other countries you might happen to be a citizen of and does not encourage or discourage the practice. In the eyes of the US, you're first and foremost an American citizen. So when I travel to Russia and back, I show my Russian passport to the Russians at the border and my American passport to the US customs officials. For many, the naturalization ceremony is an occasion for celebration. It's a relief from stress, a promise of better economic opportunities, and a ray of hope at the end of the long journey. People bring their entire families to this event. They smile, cry tears of uh, alleviation, and hug their relatives. I went alone. My husband wanted to bring our four children along with his parents, but I didn't want anyone to see how I renounce and abjure all allegiance to Russia. On that cold, dreary March morning, I felt like a traitor and I did not want any witnesses to my, to my disgrace. I did not want any pictures taken or lunches eaten in honor of my abandoning my heritage. I'll stop here. <laughs> Ala, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and I think, I think you did give us a good flavor of where it goes there. So wonderful writing. Thank you so much. Okay, um, next we have, um, if she's there, I think she might be on Alyssa's um, uh, computer. Uh, Amanda Judd, are you able to read a poem or two? Um, yeah, but like Alyssa, I'm going to have to have you pull it up on the screen for me. Okay, let me do that then. Um, I'm going to do... Uh, I'm gonna wrap myself. Here. That's fine. And I just share my screen. Still not looking forward to the 80 degree weather. Okay, there we go. All righty, thank you. She's the cat's meow. Every woman should have the self confidence of my cat Eleanor. She struts across the kitchen as if she is a jaguar on the catwalk. She drops her 25 pounds of catness to the floor where she sprawls out belly up and looks back over her shoulder as if to say, you wish. Yes. That's good, that's good. Okay, I'm just looking at the table of contents to get to the next one. I think it's page 33, here I go. Zooming through. There we go. Summer. She was summer, hot and humid with only the slightest of breezes and for relief. Caramel corn skin, 
moving slowly and sultry, ignoring fall, trying to sneak up behind her. Sweat, honeysuckles, and lemonade were her scents. The sun itself, her hair, her eyes, two swimming pools with no lifeguard on duty. And when she spoke, it had all the joy and laughter of a county fair. She was summer. How do I make this disappear so I can see all of it? Um, okay, thanks. Um, creating art, standing on a lifetime of poem of words of poems, or perhaps balancing on a heap of trash. I seek wisdom, guidance. The published all-knowing professor says that I don't know how to create art. You need to leave blood on the page, he says, talking with his hands. Ah, I see, blood it must be. It is not enough to withdraw the heart itself from its cage and leave it beating between the lines. Okay, those are great poems. I do want to point out that um, Amanda also had a, a one act play in here, um, but but we don't have time to read all of that. So. Oh, good, because I don't want to read that. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you very Thanks. much, Amanda. Okay. Um, and I'm going to uh, unspotlight you. Oops, there we go. Uh, and let's see. So the next person on my list. Um, so Jessica Ferreira, are you still here? She texted me or she messaged me and said she was having trouble with her connection. And I don't see her in my list. So if Jessica is able to come back um it would be great if she could read for us so we'll keep an eye out for her so after jessica um lisa uh lisa ronan are you ready to read something yes i am okay um i'm going to spotlight you and before you start reading i'll just share my screen um so people can see the beginning of one of your poems. I'm going to back up to a little bit earlier in the magazine. I think you're, uh, there, there's one. Okay, so there's one. Uh, and uh, yeah, I don't okay. know if that's one of the ones you're going to read, but I'll just, I'll just mention that's one of them. Sure, I'll, I'll see if I can get through all three of them. I think it won't take too long. Um, so um, I don't have an introduction for this one, so I'll just dive in. I have an introduction for the last one. In the morning when I wake, how lovely to hear love when you say my name while I wake with warm sunlight aglow in horizontal lines on the wall opposite my bed, entering empty spaces between tilted wooden window blinds. Instead, you called me vile and squalid, voice rank, wilting with indifference. I never listened to a word you said. I just moved on. And the second one, the next one is called Time Unfolding. This is actually a little bit of something between prose and poetry maybe. Isla left, it was simple. The water lapping in the river had told her to go. The house, halting her quietly. It was time. Isla was pulled against her will in both directions, a boat, tossing, perilous, listing. The city was sullen, saluting with empty streets, flashing yellow stoplights. There was no excitement like she remembered in the traffic or the flow of agitated shoppers, restaurants chilled, theaters mute. It was time. Isla waited for music, motion to carry her. The seasons were obstinately off. It had been summer in November, now May, a bleak winter. She closed the door after months of preparation. It was time. Isla was flustered and wary. The air was taciturn, reticent. Isla waited, wishing. A prism of thoughts pulsed near the surface. It had smelled like jasmine in June. Wisteria, amethyst above the doorways, lined the road that curving around the villas unraveled out of sight. She peered to see 
unfurling distance. She excused herself for her confusion. Isla wanted to go back to the river to calm her thoughts. She had planned, but never expected for time to come at her with both fists raised. It was time, but she wanted to put time back in its bottle, throw it out to sea. The waves would suck it away or push it back to shore, bobbing in the white crescents. She could decide later, if ever it came back to her. The sky was silver gray, then bright and benign. It was like Isla to feel like she had to go two places at once, stay and leave, run and hide. Time receded, Isla stood still, listening. Then shifting her feet, a geological era unfolded unceremoniously. And if there's still time, I have the last short one is um, the following. It's an ekphrastic poem based on the Amadeo Modigliani's painting, The Little Servant Girl. Do you, can you, I don't know, would that be worth showing that at all since it was based on the picture that was published in the magazine, maybe help? Oh, I asked a big one. There. Okay, the little servant, little servant girl. Thank you so much. Lips in adolescent pouts, blush on childish cheek. Warily hidden are the reddened, swollen hands, clasped, uneasy in your lap. Fingers fret, but cannot belie. The head tilted in regal poise, plinth-like neck, ponderance, gravitas, and royal bearing. Poverty, no less inspiring of reverence. Dignity, no less for burden of labor. Surveying ailing eyes, piercing uneven eyes, clear blue hurt child eyes, embarrassed, scrutinized, plain blue dress, uniform of humility, awaiting ridicule. Your vulnerability surpasses melancholy women in broad strokes of red gouache, recumbent, nude and idle, lofty lang languid flamboyant women lazing, fade and pale in your sympathetic glow. His loving eye gave you dignity. Thank you. Thank you for that, Lisa. Thank you. On reading. Okay. Uh, and I will unspotlight you. Um, there we go. And um, so um, she wasn't on my list to read, but I think that's Christine. Is that Christine? And do you want to read? Sure, I can read. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> There's yeah. wind. So if it gets loud, I'm sorry. I'm going to spotlight you. Um, yeah. So why don't you, uh, let's sorry. see if you want, I can, yeah. Are you, do, do you have your piece ready to go or do you need me to share? Um, it? I'll need you to share if that's all right. Okay. Then I'm going to just spin back to, let's see, where are we? I think around in the 20s there we go leaving home leaving home is not like flying the nest it is like diving headfirst into a shallow public pool chlorinated water flooding your sinuses as your skull thumps the slick concrete at the bottom you float to the surface, blood spilling out of your nostrils, staining the water red. Bubbles rise from the bottom half of your bathing suit as you struggle to reach the ladder, eyes shut tight from your head pain and the bright sunlight that litters your face with freckles and dyes your skin hot pink. You had hopes that the pool would cool your burn, but the pool was heated and it stung almost as much as your crush's laughter at you, at your pain, at your embarrassment. He looks like a younger Orlando Bloom, raising his finger to point at you, finally getting out of the pool, only to trip over a plastic chair. Tears cloud your round, blushing face, and bloody snot oozes from your nose into your mouth while you cry for your mother to take you home. Thank you, Christine. Your, your, your pieces in the magazine have given us the rare treat of humorous poetry. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, let's see. And so we got one more, I think. There we go. I was never taught how to use a lawnmower because my parents didn't want me to lose a foot. 
by me. If you could see how clumsy I am, you would understand. When God turned me into this world in his heavenly, heavenly cauldron, he forgot the pinch of hand-eye coordination and he left out the tablespoon of social grace, but he added a few heaping pounds of childhood obesity as well as a handful of major depressive disorder just for good measure. I was formed into a messy, messy buttery compound and thrust into this world to be spread on burnt toast, then dropped on the floor face down. <laughs> Thank you so much, Christine. That Thank was you. great. Okay, let's see. And I'm going to remove the spotlight from you. And uh, who's next on my list? Um, so is Nora Huberti here? She said she was going to read, but I don't see her here. So I'll have to maybe come back for her if she comes in later. Um, Erin Holland, you're here though. Would you like to read your piece? Yeah, I can do that. Okay. Find it here really quick. All right. And I will spotlight you and while you're looking for the piece i will see if i can find it in the magazine as well um page 44 oh perfect thank you yeah there it is okay okay um good to go yep okay. um so this is called for me for me Euphoria is existing in a space where people see me, see you for as you feel. My bad. It can be a baggy t-shirt that falls just right over the chest. It can be tattered sneakers held together by a single stitch. It's grease covered hands, it's facial hair, and it's sweat on my brow. It's the word partner, the word lover, the pronouns they, them, and theirs. It's the disruption of a room, its heads turning in a far too familiar place where I once showed myself the way I was expected. It's my partner calling me handsome, calling me beautiful, calling me. It's the way I feel when I'm alone in a space with no expectations of presentation or participation in a place it's hard to call home. That's beautiful. Thank you, Erin. And you also had artwork. Was it just the picture of the swans? Or yeah. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that at all? Sure. Um, this picture um, was taken while me and my partner were on a walk over in Como. Um, and there was just two, it was like the first two swans of the season. And I just thought it was really sweet. And I titled it The Lovers because we were on a walk. Um, and it kind of just reminded, of, reminded me of us. So um, I just thought it was a silly little picture where they were both kind of face down. <laughs> just thought it was sweet yeah their heads are underwater <laughs> kind of an ironic comment perhaps okay <laughs> thank you so much Erin that was great okay so let's see um I think I saw yeah Sam Fow um it looks like you're here um uh, I didn't have you on the list but do you want to read I can certainly try it Okay, hang on a second. Are you able, are you able to turn on your video or are you on a of course not. Are you on a funky connection? Let's see. I'm just I'm on a bad laptop, laptop, so okay. All right. Uh, let's see. So it doesn't look like I can spotlight you if you're if you're if your camera's not on. So um That's no problem. Share, my, share my screen and show um uh, I think you have a couple of pieces in here, don't you? Um, let me see. Let me find one. Um, what would you like to read? You, you've got um, a simple oh. love poem, or you've got you could read part of um, extra shot. Uh, the poems would be probably the best choice. Okay. Mm -hmm. And let's see. So that's gonna be. Whoops. <laughs> This one? E. All right. Well, a simple love poem. As I walked through the valley of shadow, I knew not fear, for I was nourished 
by that saucy doe. I was blind, but then I saw that some blind golden brown glow of cold three-day-old pizza. Give me not a piping hot pie, nor a slightly cooled slice, for I would rather die. No, give me pizza that is old. I do not care the cost. On this I will never fold. The chewy rubbery texture of the bite like a stretchy red dodgeball is a true delight. The soggy crust beneath is a lovely treat, spongy and flexible from absorbed sauce. In it all, my anxieties and fears, the za doth yeet. For the simulacrum of life is a mere phony without the salivating taste of stale pepperoni. And what forsooth is the odd taste rot an earthly fuzziness spice? Is it mold? Hope not. I'm sure the pain in my stomach is something completely unrelated. For in 3 day old pizza, I could never sick. And as my soul crosses through Charon's ferry, those left behind will find solace, because at the funeral, we're serving dairy. <laughs> Though the parting tastes so bitter Swedish, I move to a better place past those burly gates where St. Peter's stacking on some deep dish. It seems the Catholic Church forgot an important point, not in body nor blood, but in stuffed crust and garlic sauce we anoint. For when Ezekiel saw that blessed wheel, it was in fact a Swiss veggie supreme, a real holy meal. For God is a three-day-old pizza. <laughs> okay. All right. And Sam has a short story here, which I have uh, not enough time to read that. But there's at least one more poem. I thought I'd scroll to that. All right. If you, if you want to read, do you want to read your poem? Ah, uh, I can. Okay. Yeah. Yellow timbered melancholy resonates. From rose tinted marbles, I write this memoir with the steady vibrations of string separates the memory of my father's guitar. He was an elm tree when he played, commanding silence and strength in those precious songs. Emotion and hope from his voice degraded, like mere music could right all the world's wrongs. The contrapasso of his music's persona to the failing strength of his frame, like the twinge of winter's kiss in Arizona, ashes of the man who once was who remain only in name. He grows weaker by the day, cancer's cruel degradation, his smile and warmth losing its sanguine embrace, his fingers stiff and atrophied with stagnation, those beautiful songs all but erased. Though his mem melodies have been lost to the zephyr, I will carry his strength with me forever. Great. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Um, so is there anybody here? Th th these are all the people that I had on my list to read. Is there anybody here who had a piece in the Paper Lantern um, and they'd like to read it and I've missed them? I've overlooked them? Anybody? Okay. Um, how about um, we have uh, we have about ten minutes left of the reading. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm seeing something in the chat. Oh, cool, it's just Luca saying hello uh, <laughs> and congratulations to everybody. Um, yeah, uh, we've got about ten minutes left. If somebody from the capstone class wants to read a piece um, by someone who isn't here. Um, but they would like to spotlight that person's work. Is there anyone who wants to do that? Or is there anybody from the Creative Writing Club, maybe, who's wanting to read a piece? Yeah? Um, it looks like maybe Christine wants to read a piece. Yeah, I'll... Um read anything sorry <laughs> I, I don't have it in front of me so i'll just read whatever oh okay. ask her if there's copies on campus yet oh um by the way tom wants to know if there are copies on campus yet um Since you know here. i thought they would have been here today but i haven't gotten anything from the printer so okay um, but i will um i can since we're here i could like maybe check yeah, yeah, they, they okay. would have been delivered to the mail room next to the Dean of Humanities office. That's okay. what they were supposed to do. So, okay. yeah, so you could go check over there. Okay, sounds good. Thank okay, you. Um, let's see. Um, Capstone people, do you do you, do you have any requests um, for Christine to read? Jessica's work? 
Was it the... That's right. Yeah, Jessica Castrello isn't here for some reason. So, um, yeah. Um, let me share my screen and uh, let's see. We got a couple of things here. Um... There's a poem. Would you prefer to read a poem or a prose piece? Um, it, I have no preference. I'm sure they're both wonderful. We haven't had a lot of prose. So why don't you read this for a few minutes? Uh, we'll, we'll say about okay. five minutes and then I'll, 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 well, can you tell, can you tell when to stop? Are you able to keep track of your time? You can just cut me off. I'll understand. <laughs> Okay, hang on a second. Uh, okay, now you're spotlit too. Okay, great. My name is Marlena Rosalie Juana del Portillo Epifania Hernandez Amador. Everyone calls me Mar. At the, at the astute age of nine, I announced my ambition to become an author. I would be the first in my family to graduate college. I swore I would make it big and lift my family out of poverty, a bulb of a notion that would die before petals, stems, or leaves. At 11.50 p.m. on a fucking Monday, no less, I let my family down. I hate Mondays. I sit at my desk staring at my novella. The piece was a mess. The words were stitched together careful, carelessly onto the pages with no direction like macaroni art. The lack of subplot was nothing short of horrific, and my character development was as tactful as George W. Bush on a political debate. <laughs> it's hard for me to come up with a reason my reader should care about my story, because I sure don't. It's a web of no weaver, but I will have to do. But it will have to do. I have my one-on-one -on -one in Carajo, four minutes. I gather up my pathetic excuse for a manuscript, light a fire under my ass, and dart out the front door. Through the enclave of Bear River College is hugged by starlit black, it pulses with life. Legless drunks, primitive reflections of students drowning themselves in the fool's anesthetic, meander through the streets like Neanderthals from one arbitrary to the next. Belt, belted by the communities of Galesburg, Illinois, over 180 years old and spinning, uh, spanning 82 acres, Bear River is an impressive establishment. My building, Casa Esperanza, is at the southernmost point of the campus. I'm to meet Dr. Loomings, my creative writing professor and mentor, for my one-on-one -on -one review at the Reticence Library. I thought it was strange he would request to meet at midnight, but I didn't question it. It's an honor to review with an established author like himself and a chance I am not willing to pass up. Don't waste my time, he had instructed. Don't be late. It's about a six minute stroll to the library from Casa Esperanza. I am not strolling. I ran my cursed writers run up my hair, up my up Heritage Street to the library on Manor Row. If there is a God, I will make it. I was so lost in constructing scenarios for this meeting. I hardly noticed when I came upon the old library doors. Bursting like a rogue wave on the Indian Ocean across the bow of a ship, I enter. I glance at a clock on the wall, 12.03 AM. My heart caps as if like the SS Edmund Fitzgerald on the icy waters of Lake Superior. Lake Superior. Maybe I can still catch Dr. Loomings. As far as I can tell, there is no one at the library. I'm sure I've missed it. I convince myself to continue to the meeting at place anyway. Out of breath, out of hope, and out of time. We were to meet in the Red Room on the second floor near Special Collections and Archives. I always thought that name was funny since the whole room was draped in, all, draped in white. The library is as stunning as one would expect. Three stories tall with books lining every wall. It had velvet carpets and mullion windows like something out of a Disney movie. In intricate and vast with so many nooks and crannies, one could lose themselves between the pages. Luckily, I spent countless hours here. This labyrinthine world couldn't trap me. Making my way through the various rooms, I noticed the library was oddly quiet. The air hung, still yet full, still yet full like a pregnant pause. People may people say spirits haunt the library, that the books have eyes. Well, I'm not one for such superstitious surmisings, though I still found an eagerness in my step and a chill in my spine. The absence of life takes its toll. Fear begins to tap at my heart like a faucet that drips into a sink. The shelves narrow as the walls, walls grows in the darkness. The books have eyes. 
My walk has stiffened and with every step, I'm sure my heart will rip through my chest. There's nothing to be afraid of, I assure myself. To fear, to be fearful, that's just a natural response to the world. It's as ubiquitous as sunlight on cracked pavement. Skirting the shadows, I approach the dappled glow of the red room and can feel the dissipation of delirium. Checkpoint. Hope you don't mind me ending ending you like that. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. It was a nice surprise. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Christine, for doing that reading. Um, um, that uh, that was a, a, the beginning of a, a, a horror piece by Jessica Castrello. So um, I think we've I think we've got everything. Um, so thank you guys so much um, for reading. And um, yeah, if if the paper lanterns can't be found on campus today, they should be there this week. I think it uh, was it they started printing it last Tuesday, um, and I think it should be done by now or very soon. So that's it. Um, Chris, is there anything else we should say? Um, thank you all for coming. And I am so happy to see this level of work during probably the worst freaking year of all of our lives. Uh, you, you guys continue to amaze me and everyone else. So keep writing, please. And um, keep taking creative writing classes. <laughs> <laughs> that too. <laughs>